Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to have the opportunity to speak to you in this intimate environment. I have to confess, I've been inserted into this time slot strategically to test your attention span. <laughs> so, <laughs> brace yourself while we explore the versatility of solar technology and enjoy the ride. I'd like to start off with the philosophy of the TEDx events, ideas worth spreading. What we're really talking about here are ideas and people and connecting them together. But in my case, I want to talk about a series of ideas, a series of technologies that I've stumbled upon in the literature that I found particularly interesting or unique. So that's where we are today. But with respect to photovoltaic history, it's important to note that back in the 70s, solar cells became ubiquitous through the use of uh, handheld calculators. And this, this, all of a sudden, people had at their fingertips digital computation anywhere in the world at any time if uh, diffuse light was present. Only a decade prior, geosynchronous satellites orbiting the Earth were primarily powered by uh, solar photovoltaic cells. But it was all the way back in 1839 where Sir Alexander Becquerel first discovered the photovoltaic effect. So while we've been comfortable with photovoltaic technology for some time, it's been over 150 years since we first discovered this effect. But I'm, ta I'm going to talk about more than just photovoltaics. But first, I want to talk a little bit about lenses and mirrors. By the time sunlight reaches the Earth, it's relatively diffuse. And so we need to recognize the capacity for lenses and mirrors to concentrate this light and make it more useful. So let's start off with a convex lens. If we shine light through this lens, we can bend it. We can concentrate it to a focal point and increase its intensity. If we want to use a convex lens for a large area, it becomes problematic in that the lens becomes very large, heavy, and expensive. And we can't just shrink the size of it because that changes the optical properties, which is uh, unacceptable. What we can do is we can employ a Fresnel lens, which is a discretized approximation of a convex lens. If you look at the slope of the convex lens, it exactly matches that of the Fresnel lens in the discrete segments that it's broken down into. And the Fresnel lens functions exactly the same as a convex lens, all bite at a lower weight, lower cost, and, and uh, therefore simpler to employ. And this is what it looks like in real life. Equally important as lenses are mirrors, and more specifically parabolic mirrors. If we shine light at a parabolic mirror, we can focus it at a central point and increase its intensity. But in practice, true, continuous, smooth parabolic mirrors are primarily reserved for astronomical observatories who can afford it. They're just far too expensive to manufacture and machine, so typically we approximate them with a series of linear flat mirrors uh, to produce the same effect, just at a lower efficiency. Lenses and mirrors come at a cost. They're very sensitive to orientation. On the left is a fixed lens that does not track the sun, and on the right we have a lens that does track the sun. In the first orientation, the fixed lens is properly oriented, but as the sun moves, the fixed lens loses focus and becomes useless. So it's important to recognize that if you're considering lenses or mirrors, you have to pay very special attention to orientation. So this provides a brief summary of how lenses and mirrors can be used to concentrate light and make it more useful. The next technology I'd like to highlight are hybrid systems. And by hybrid systems, I mean the assembly of a variety of systems to exploit the synergistic relationships between them. So let's start off with a photovoltaic cell. We know that if we shine light on it, we can produce electrical energy, and some of that light will be converted into heat, and the panel will heat up. It turns out that the efficiency of a solar panel decreases at higher temperatures. In this case, since the light is diffuse, not a big deal. <clears throat> And in this case, about 10% of the incident light on that panel is being converted to electrical energy. Let's say we wanted to make better use of this panel just because they're so expensive. Let's say we wanted to concentrate that light and produce more electrical energy out of the same panel. We're going to get more electrical energy, but now we've introduced an additional complication. We're going to have a dramatically reduced efficiency due to elevated temperatures and an accelerated degradation of the system. So naturally, we ask the question, how can we cool this panel to maintain its operating temperature at something more reasonable? 
Well, what better way to do that than to introduce a solar thermal loop to extract that heat from the panel, reduce the operating temperature, and make that heat useful? In this case, we're actually making use of 70% of the incident light, 10% electronic, 60% thermal, used for space heating or whatnot in a building or home. This is termed as concentrated photovoltaics and thermal. It's quite common on the internet. I'm not so sure about in practice. The next technology I'd like to highlight are solar balloons. Now I assure you it's not what you think it is. It has nothing to do with hydrogen or helium in balloons. It has nothing to do with manned flight or the combustion of petroleum products. No, what I'm referring to is a specialized, functionalized balloon that is transparent with a black absorber plate in the center of it that is massive, greater than 50 meters in diameter, exceeding half of a soccer field. This solar balloon can be connected with a cable to an alternator to produce electrical energy, thereby exploiting the force of buoyancy, the lift force generated by heating the balloon. So let's see this in action. The sun hits the absorber, heats up the balloon, it rises to the top, producing power, ejects the heat, and the balloon declines in altitude, and the cycle continues. These balloons can rise up to altitudes exceeding five kilometers, exploiting temperature differentials of 50 degrees because the ambient temperature can be as low as minus 10 and the balloon can reach up to 40 degrees. And each balloon can produce over half a megawatt in this case. That's fine. And you might be wondering, well, what about on the way down? Because we've installed all this capacity to generate electricity, but we don't, we're not making use of the alternator when the balloon is descending. So the natural approach there is to add a second balloon and make them work in concert so that we're generating energy on the way up and on the way down. I'd like to shift the perspective of this presentation to Penticton for a moment. When I initially was working on this presentation, I asked the question to myself, well, how much electricity does Penticton consume and what fraction of that could be offset by photovoltaics? And if it was all of it, how much area would be required? It turns out that Penticton, according to 2009 stats, for its residential, commercial, and industrial sectors, consumes about 40 gigawatt hours per year. So what does that mean? Well, Kelowna is consuming about 940, Vancouver about 5,000, and it turns out to produce 40 gigawatt hours per year in Penticton, we would require approximately 150 acres of properly installed photovoltaic panels. And this area, shaded area, surrounding the Penticton airport is what I've determined would be required to be occupied with photovoltaic panels to completely power Penticton. So you might be wondering, well, how much does it cost? My back of the envelope calculations indicate about 200 million, equivalent to about $7,000 per person. Something to think about. On the global scale, there's a couple of things worth noting. The largest solar generation uh, facility is located in the Mojave Desert in California. Here, parabolic trough mirrors are being used to concentrate sunlight by a factor of 75. This heat is used to produce steam. The steam is then sent to steam turbines to generate electricity. At peak capacity, 230,000 homes can be powered by this system. On average, on an annual basis, about 650 gigawatt hours are produced. Now, if you recall from the previous slide, that's not even sufficient to power Kelowna at 940 gigawatt hours per year. But in any case, it represents a significant step forward in utilizing an environmentally friendly renewable energy resource. In Africa, there's a bit of a water problem. Not everywhere, not for everyone, but sometimes. Some people have access to water pumps. Some people have access to water, but they have to carry it. But some people experience hardship with water, and solar technology can help us there. I want to take you to a, an island off the southeast coast of Africa called Meridius, where solar desalination was delivered to this island to assist them with purifying water. Now, despite these people being surrounded by ocean water, they did not have access to clean, drinkable, potable water. By solar desalination, 
what I mean is basically solar distillation, simply the evaporation and condensation of water using solar heat. 21 units were delivered to 21 households with families inside, each unit costing $250. Five to seven liters of H2O can be produced per day, which is more than sufficient for a small family. And this meant the difference between comfort and hardship for these families. So while we can spend billions of dollars on centralized mass uh, energy generation facilities like that in the Mojave Desert, it is also the case that we can use solar technology for very simple, low-cost technologies to completely change people's lives. Solar technology can be as simple as a solar box oven. Just a box that's covered in sheet metal that can heat up and cook food. It can be as complex as a power source for global communication system. It can be a means to generate power in a centralized fashion for cities and we, we can use it to purify water. Solar energy provides a versatile artillery of technologies that we can use in our transportation, energy, and, and uh, water sectors. And it's something that we should embrace. Solar, solar energy is, is versatile, and, and there are many options with it, more than just photovoltaics or solar hot water. I'd like to... Uh, acknowledge some of the images that I've used for this presentation, and I uh, thank you for your time.